Well, can you hear me? Is that mic kind of working now? Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Well, that's quite an introduction I wrote for myself. Most of it's true, so I hope you enjoyed that. It's really good to be with you here today, and I think it's good to be with you for a particular reason. And the reason I'd like to emphasize today, I'd like to start with a bit of a story that shares why your participation in Cal is so important to me. And some of you, like Kirk, may have heard this before, so I apologize, but many of you will have not. When I worked at BYU-Hawaii, I had many <coughs> students, of course, but I remember a couple of students really well. And I had one student, and we'll call him Tyler, because I think that was his name. Uh, we had another student we'll call Andy, because I remember that was his name for sure. Tyler and Andy, both very good students, great guys to be around. Tyler actually played on the soccer team and got straight A's. No doubt about it. You just knew he was just going to do enough to get an A in the class, and that was going to be his grade point average. I'm sure he graduated with a 4.0. And when he went off to college, or when he left college, I kind of lost track of him a bit, and he went, and I'm sure he's got a perfectly good career going somewhere. Uh, but that was Tyler. And then on the other hand, you had Andy. And Andy was a solid B student. And, you know, he gets some A's and he gets some B's. I don't know if he ever dropped down to a C or something, but. Andy was involved with, in everything. He went to Namibia with me to do some research. Whenever there was an event on campus, he was the MC or playing his guitar. He joined the Students and Free Enterprise team and became one of the presenters. I mean, he was just all over the place, right? A lot like you guys. And when Andy left, he went to work for this little company. They made some kind of a drink. I think they called it like Red Bull or something like that, right? And Andy went to work for Red Bull uh, but guess what he's doing? You know all those crazy events that they do? You know, where people like put their life at risk and all that? That's Andy. He runs those events. How many of you might enjoy a job like that, do you think, for a while? Yeah. Some of you are like, yeah, yeah, that'd be all right, I guess, right? So, so that was Andy. Got a dream job, doing great things. Right now he's living in Salzburg, Austria, and, uh, and just having a great career. I, I love Andy. He's just my kind of a guy, right? On the way in from work today, I was listening, or into work, I was listening to NPR. And they were talking about what's important at university. And they said, yes, of course, it's important to attend class, to get good grades, to study hard and all that. But increasingly, employers are looking at, what else did you do? What were you involved in? And as Cal students, you guys get that. And that's why it's so great to be with you here today, is because here's a group of students who really get it. So anyway, thinking about my own background, what value I might add, you've heard from a lot of great people, I'm sure. And they've probably been leaders from government, they've been leaders from business, they've been leaders from uh, university and so forth. And they've probably brought a lot to the table. Thinking about my own career, where it's taken me, what I might add to the conversation, uh, I thought, you know, maybe we ought to talk about some issues of cross-cultural business, cross-cultural uh, involvement, and kind of how that plays out in terms of leadership. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you have been to more than one foreign country in your lifetime? Great. How many of you have been to more than five foreign countries in your lifetime? Okay. Anybody more than 10? If anybody can beat me, I'll take you out to lunch. Anybody more than 40? <laughs> all right. I'm a lot older than you. You'll get there. So it's, uh, it's all good. Uh, there's a little bit of my background, right? So I, I graduated from BYU. I served the LDF mission to Portugal. Then I went off to Wharton to do my PhD. I went to BYU Hawaii from Wharton, which uh, a lot of folks at Wharton are kind of like, you're going where again? BYU Hawaii? Isn't that some no-name school that we've absolutely never heard of? I'm like, yeah, but it's in Hawaii. Like, oh, yeah, okay, okay, got it, right? <laughs> but I didn't choose it because it was in Hawaii. As you can imagine with my hair color and deep, dark, savage tan, uh, I tend to turn red rather than brown when I'm in Hawaii. Uh, but I went there because 40% of the student body was international. And that's just always floated my boat from day one. Right? I was the kid who was always looking at the National Geographic magazine. And not for the reasons some of you are thinking, but because it was just, I love the international stuff, right? And so that was me, going international, going to BYU Hawaii, and that was a great experience. After I left BYU Hawaii, I spent some time in, in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, you might know Dubai, right? Or Abu Dhabi. Uh, the American University of Sharjah and Zayed University are both in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, left the Middle East to go to Nigeria and to help found a business school there and kind of get it off the ground, get it running. That was a heck of an experience that, uh, yeah, anyway, that was a heck of an experience. 
Then I went to Al Faisal University in the Middle East in, in uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and spent two years there getting business school going at the brand new university. And then I thought, hey, where's the next exotic hotspot? Or in Utah. <laughs> so I came to Utah Valley University. And actually, I've grown up just a couple blocks north of campus here. And so it's a bit of a homecoming for me. Um, so anyway, I've done work in about 23 different countries, visited 42 countries, etc. Uh, and, and that's just who I am. I'm a bit of an internationalist. Now, I guess the question that I have for you guys is, is it possible anymore to be a leader and not take cross-cultural elements into consideration and make them part of your portfolio? Do you think it's possible? I mean, kind of the PC answer is, no, it's not possible, you know? It, it, it may be. You may be able to spend an entire career doing whatever you love to do without having too much cross-cultural interaction. But I would encourage you to visit the local elementary schools to get a view of what the wave of the future is going to be like, right? If you go to those elementary schools, you won't see a lot of kids who look a lot like me. You will. But you won't see as many as you might think you will. You'll see a lot of kids who look like my good friend, I hope I, he doesn't mind me putting him on the spot, Jeremy Garcia, right? The, Jeremy, good to see you again. We knew each other from Philadelphia days. And, and, and what's happening is that children of Hispanic or Latino uh, ancestry are increasingly filling the roles of our school. And in a lot of ways, that's a great thing, right? Because it brings a richness and a diversity to our lives that we might not otherwise have. The reality, though, is that the future of this valley, even if you chose to make your career here in Utah Valley, you're still going to have a large Hispanic population, as you well know, we've got a fairly large uh, Pacific Island population. We have reasonable populations of Native Americans, uh, a few Asians. We're not a big Asian population kind of a group. But these are all groups who come with kind of a certain cultural set of assumptions that may influence how you exert leadership. I can promise you it's very different how you practice leadership in Saudi Arabia compared to the United States. And I want to take you through some of that today. So, with the click of the magic button, hopefully, or this magic button. You know, you probably can't get along without knowing how to do technology either, but, you know, we'll see what happens. Let's just look at culture. This is a definition from a Dutch uh, researcher named Hofstede. Uh, he talked about culture being the collective programming of the mind, which distinguishes the members of one group or category of people from another fairly standard kind of uh, academic jargon, right? Let's try to break it down a little bit. So, culture is a system of values. It's particular to one group. It's learned, it's not innate, right? So if you take a kid who was born in Zimbabwe, when he's one years old, and you put him in the United States, with, you know, perhaps through adoption or something with an American family, that kid's gonna grow up with American cultural values, most likely. The other way, a kid from the US gets adopted into a family in Zimbabwe, is gonna grow up with those uh, Zimbabwean kind of values. It tends to be passed down from one generation to the next. You tend to learn your culture from your parents. Um, if your parents are first generation immigrants into the United States and you kind of grew up in the high schools, you may have felt some of the tension there on occasion, right? So it predictably influences behavior. It's only one influence on behavior, right? There are a lot of other things. Can you, what else besides culture influences the way you behave? Gender. Gender could, sure. Parents. Parents. Situation. Situation. Personal experience. All these things, right? And culture is only one piece of that, and I don't want to overestimate it. But in many interactions which I've experienced in my leadership, uh, it has had an influence, so I want to make us aware of these. Uh, it's fairly stable. That passes down through generation to generation in fairly stable ways, though things do change over time. It's taken for granted. Who grew up in the United States? You. What's the American culture? <laughs> exactly. Good answer. <laughs> Dom. You know, we don't think about that unless we've kind of been taught to kind of certain ways to measure it and so forth, right? That's a common reaction. I know I jumped in too quick. You would have said something very intelligent, I'm sure, eventually. <laughs> um, but, but that's kind of how we think about culture, right? It's like, well, what do you mean, what's my culture? Right? It's, um, what, apple pie, I guess? Baseball? I don't really like baseball. I don't know what it is, right? So we kind of take it for granted. And then it even influences how we see the world. I remember early in my career, I saw this study. And in this study, there, the, 
the researchers had taken a group of kids from elementary schools in the United States, and they showed them a picture of a zebra, right? And then they'd asked the kids, and they'd said, what color is a zebra? Any idea what the kids said? OK. They said it was a white animal with black stripes. Now, then they took the same picture and asked the question of a group of school children. I think it was South Africa. I don't quite remember which African country it was. And what did they say? Black animal with white stripes, right? I thought, this is really interesting. Culture's influencing how we see the world. So I thought, you know, I'm going to do this in the Middle East. And you, do you know what they respond in the Middle East? Let me show you. <laughs> All right, well. <laughs> All right, that sounds right, very good. OK, so it influences the way we see the world. Now, I, I want to be a little careful. Maybe I'll take us ahead a couple of slides here. I want to be a little careful, because we're going to talk about some stereotypes today. And, and there's dangers to stereotypes, right? Stereotypes can be inaccurate. There's an outlier problem. In other words, you know, okay, maybe 60% of the people in the United States have shared this cultural value, but what about that 20% on this end who don't, the 20% on this end who don't? Sometimes they can be offensive. I found this out when I went to uh, BYU Hawaii. You know, some of my big Samoan friends thought it was bad that I called them lazy. They said, hey, we're just chill, bro. You know, we know how to live life, how to enjoy it, and so forth, right? And then they'd be, yeah. That was, uh, you know, another offensive stereotype, but it worked for them in that instant. Um, so as we think about stereotypes, number one, we ought to be very conscious of where our stereotypes come from. There's some very good research out there that may build what we would call stereotypes, or some ideas of the values that people hold. But as we think about stereotypes, we should use them self-consciously. I'm aware that I'm using a stereotype. And tentatively, what does tentatively mean again? A little carefully, cautiously, something like that, perhaps. As if recognizing the stereotype is no more than a temporary hold on an elusive reality. So anytime you walk into a situation, if you're a manager and you're going abroad, you may be thinking about, hmm, how do I create a motivation system that works in this culture? And if you know something about the culture going into it, you may have some ideas to how to set things up initially, right? But then you may change that idea as you gain more and more experience with the culture. I remember the first time I went to the Middle East, there was not much of that time written about teaching in the Middle East, about UAE culture, you know, Dubai. And, but I did find some information on Saudi Arabia. How many of you here are from Saudi? No, I didn't think so. All right. So, so I read the information about Saudi, and it said that Saudis don't have a very good sense of humor. I thought, oh, crap. I am sorry, because I like joking around you know, in class and so forth. And so I went there with that idea. I went to the UAE. They must be close to Saudi culture. They share common borders, uh, common kind of cultural heritage. And you know, I think probably for the first semester, I was just dead boring, probably. You know? OK, I didn't last that long. I did hold the idea tentatively, and I tried a couple of little jokes to see if they work, right? And lo and behold, guess what happened? These kids like to laugh too, right? They like an enjoyable class as well instead of a boring class, right? So, so I had to change that idea fairly quickly. And I've always meant to go back to whoever wrote that article and said, man, where, you know, where'd you come up with this crap, right? Because it just wasn't true at all. So anyway, holding them self-consciously and tentatively. And you know, on the other side, how not to use them, just the opposite. Unselfconsciously and conclusively, suggesting the stereotype is indeed valid and a stable categorization that is somehow inherent in the world. And there's the person who said that. OK, let's run back real quick. When, when we come down to culture and leadership, then, I think there's a couple of questions that we need to ask ourselves. Number one, what is appropriate within a given culture? In other words, are there certain things that are specific to a given culture that manifest themselves as good leadership? Okay. I'll just give you one little example today, and, and maybe we'll do some contrast today between Mexico and the United States since we share a common border, and, and that's a cultural interaction you're likely to, to have. Um, in the United States, if you've been assigned a task by your fearless leader, Kurt Young, and about every half hour he comes into your office or place of work and asks you how it's going, and ask you specific questions about what you're doing, what do you think of him? Micromanager. Micromanager. Jerk. Did I hear jerk? <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> 
Micromanager, absolutely, you know? We may think jerk, it's kind of like, you don't trust me? I mean, give me a chance, let me do this, let me try, right? Well, for a lot of Mexican employees, when American companies would go to Mexico, the maquiador industry, you know, they'd use this same kind of, yeah, I'm not gonna micromanage, here's the task, you know, let's talk about it in a week, see how it's going, kind of a thing, right? And for a certain number of Mexican employees, they kept waiting for the boss to come in. Where is he? And there's a cultural norm there that says, yeah, when my boss checks on me, I know that he cares. He thinks I have potential. He's seeing how I'm doing, <laughs> right? So you can just imagine, in terms of a leadership conflict, the problem that creates when you have a Mexican leader trying to manage in the US or vice versa, right? That can create some pretty big problems. So, number one, what's appropriate within a given culture? And then number two, it, are there traits that are appropriate across multiple cultures? And of course, you've talked about trait theory in your, uh, what we call it, Management 1250? Principles of Leadership class. What do you remember about trait theory? Anything? They're born with certain traits that make you good leaders. Okay. And what else? That's right. One of the things we found fairly soon was that there aren't a lot of traits that we can say you're just born with that make you a good leader, right? We went into contingency theories of leadership and situational theories of leadership and said, look, the same trait that works over here may not work over here, right? And this is kind of where the cross-cultural piece fits in to the overall leadership kind of theories. I once saw a study that looked at, that looked at enduring traits and they said, well, one of them is leaders are slightly taller than their average follower. You've probably you know, heard about that. Yeah, and average intelligence, are you going to fist pump again? Or? Possibly. Possibly, all right, fair enough. Average intelligence instead of super high intelligence. What happens to the super high intelligent people? They become professors and make no money, right? <laughs> all right, so average intelligence. And then I once saw a study that said Arab leaders have uh, a larger than average nose size as compared to their followers, and I thought, <laughs> Where does this stuff come from, right? So anyway, but there was some research, and I had a chance to be involved with a little bit of this. You've heard of uh, Bob House, Path Goal Theory of Leadership. I, I, I won't ask you to remember this. We may talk about it a little bit later. Um, Bob House was at Wharton, and I had a chance to work with him, and that was kind of cool. It made me feel good about myself to work with somebody who had a theory. Um, and he did this great globe study, and it's probably been 10 years ago now, and I think they got up to 62, 64 countries, something like that. I mean, it was a pretty good sample. And as I recall, they looked at multiple um, industries, including transportation, financial, and it seems like there's one more, but I don't recall. Do you recall what it was, Kurt? Yeah. Anyway, so, so they had a very good sample. I mean, the methodology was impeccable and so forth. And, and they found some traits that are kind of universally associated with leaders. So it doesn't matter if you're in Mexico, if you're in the Middle East, if you're in the United States, if you're in Taiwan, um, leaders tend to be future-oriented. They have this ability to anticipate, they think through future scenarios and what may be coming down the road. They also tend to be a bit ambitious, which probably makes some sense. <laughs> they also tend to be rational, analytic people. They're informed, they're logical, they're clear, they can make decisions, they, they engage you intellectually, there's some stimulation there when you're talking with them. Uh, of course, they're motivational, they, they build an inspiration and confidence, they're positive. Interesting here, I think Stephen Covey wrote a book called The Speed of Trust, didn't he? Is that who wrote that? Um, you know, so they're trustworthy. That's interesting. I, I've known a lot of leaders who weren't particularly trustworthy. Maybe that's why I've moved around so often in my career. <laughs> Team oriented, they tend to build teams. They were collaborative, they were integrators, coordinators, etc. And then on the negative side of this, you had leaders who were, uh, these were kind of traits not associated with leaders. You had these traits that was negative in terms of your leadership. Individually oriented, a loner, self-interested, uh, non-egalitarian, someone who is domineering, a ruler, elitist, dictatorial, distant. Uh, people who avoided using influence. So they were things like indirect, they weren't assertive, those kinds of things. So, you know, you're trying to balance this. On the one hand, you can't be dictatorial, but you can't also be indirect or subservient. You know, you've got to strike that balance. And then leaders were not seen as being tender and sensitive. Now that's kind of interesting because we've heard a lot about kind of female styles of management and male styles of management, and female styles being kind of more collaborative and more sensitive to people's feelings and so forth, emotional intelligence, right? So, so in that study then, these were kind of traits that, that, that crossed these global boundaries, right? All right.
So now, those are traits that kind of work very well in, in, in a variety of cultures. Now we're going to try, kind of cross cultures and see what some of those differences are and just give you a taste for what some of those differences are and some of that I've experienced in my own career. I like this quote. Transcultural effectiveness is not measured only by the degree to which you're able to grasp the opposite value. It is measured by your competence in reconciling the dilemma. In other words, the degree to which you're able to make both values work together. So it's just not that knowledge, it's that skill, right? Pulling those different cultural values together. Does anybody know who said that, by the way? Me neither. It's announced plagiarism. I think um, we'll attribute it to um, Belinda. Oh, okay. thanks, Belinda. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, now Hofstede, there, there was this research I brought up earlier, Hofstede. How many of you have ever done anything with Hofstede's work? Any hands? Nobody at all? Well, this will be fun. All right, so, so Gerhard Hofstede was a researcher in the late 1960s, 1970s, and before you go, uh, old stuff, uh, it's held up well over the years. And he, he took a look at culture and what we call thin description of culture. Um, you know, just kind of these little stereotypical traits and what different countries ranked on those. And he and his research team uh, surveyed, I believe it was 113,000 folks that worked for one company. Now, because of privacy arrangements, I can't tell you what the company is, but its initials were IBM. That's <laughs> like an old computer company for those of you who are. <laughs> All right, so, so what they came up with is they came up with, or Hofstede came up with these four cultural traits later out of the fifth that we want to talk about today. And one of them was called uncertainty avoidance. And uncertainty avoidance is just what it sounds like. How comfortable are you with ambiguity? How comfortable are you with risk, right? And so then they correlated, the research team correlated these with certain activities that happened at work. So for example, people who are low on uncertainty avoidance, in other words, were okay with risk, and uncertainty. They tend to experience lower job stress. They were less resistant to change from an emotional perspective. They changed employers you know, somewhat frequently. Loyalty to an employer, eh, not such a big deal, right? And you see some of the other ones. Um, managers should be selected on criteria other than seniority, more risk taking in the business, etc. The opposite on this side, loyalty to employers is seen as a virtue. I like to work in large organizations. Why would somebody with a, a low tolerance for ambiguity or a low tolerance for risk want to work in a large organization? Stability. Okay, stability. Uh, I was going to say stability because it's, it's already established. Yeah, you kind of think there's less chance of going out of business. Over here, we have one more. It was a really good idea. Raise your hand, take credit for it. I said stable. Ah, so kind of like stability, but stable. <laughs> All right, so stability, right? So stability is one thing, but also very clear cut job path. Right? Oh, I'm going to be here for five years, then I'll move up to this rank, then I'll move up to that rank, my whole career is planned out, my life is good, right? And, and I don't mean to demean either side of that, right? Neither side is right, neither side is wrong, <laughs> it's just a value held, you know, within society. Okay, so we can go through a whole bunch of the rest of those, but we won't. Now, they're the countries and kind of their listing. Now, this is one that I've never been able to understand as many years as I've talked to this. I think it's ridiculous, you know, because this is a very rules-oriented culture in, in Singapore, right? Uh, but let's take a look at some of the others. So in the United States, if you're looking at the U.S., uh, you know, fairly willing to take, take risks, right? And I think that's why the U.S. has had such a great kind of entrepreneurship culture over the years, is that willingness to take risks. In the United States, if you fail at business, are you ostracized? No, we kind of entrepreneurs, you know, they, they, they get up here and they brag about, oh yeah, I failed at these three businesses and now I've made this big success and I'm rich and I donate to the university and all that, right? <laughs> On the other end, countries like Portugal, Greece, Belgium, uh, you know, you get some of the, the uh, Hispanic countries going on there. You know, not a lot of risk taking enjoyed in some of those countries. Now, how would that play out in a work situation then if you're a leader? Just make something up. But if you're a leader in a work situation, then you kind of know what to expect from your employees. So you okay. can know how to lead them better if you, if you know what kind of uncertainty they have. Okay. Can you get any more specific than that? Well, I think if you're like working in one of those countries that's on the top, then you're going to know how to approach them with different things that you want to bring into the organization. Because if it's a very risky thing, 
you want to focus on like what they're going to gain from it, and that it's if it's not so risky. Like the way that you, you say, you want to risk, right? Yeah. And you may want to build in safeguards and safety nets and so forth. I mean, think about a sales force, right? Salespeople tend to thrive on risk. Well, if I don't sell, I don't get a commission, I don't make any money, right? Um, whereas in some of the other countries, you'll see sales forces which are set up with a greater component of salary to it and a smaller commission because that, that minimizes some of that risk. So as a leader, being quite aware of that is really important as you're doing business across countries. Let's, let's take a look at the second one. This one's known as individualism and collectivism. With individualism and collectivism, it's where you take your sense of identity from, right? So if you meet a stereotypical American on the street, shake hands, who are you? My answer would probably be, oh, I'm Norm Wright. Yeah, I'm dean of the business school at UVU. I've done this, I've done this, I've done that, right? That's a highly individualistic response. It's about me. It's about my accomplishments. It's about who I am. These are cultures in which people like to stand out. In a collectivist culture, on the other hand, there's a desire not necessarily to stand out. So for example, in Japan, if you met that same person on the street, you might get a response to say something like this. Oh, I'm Norm Wright, not a stereotypical name I know for Japanese, but I'm Norm Wright, and I work for a Toyota company. Not much information about what you do for Toyota is that affiliation with this larger group. If you're from Pacific Islands, like Samoa, you belong to a Nainga. Is anybody from Samoa in here? All right. Nainga is a family, right? And it's an extended family. I remember traveling in um, French Polynesia, actually, Tahiti, and just being impressed as I visited with a family. And they were, and, and just I had one of their, their children with me on this research, and we were just visiting, and they were talking to him about his ancestors and where they came from and what land that they had, and what the village was. And I thought, man, I, I, I can't imagine going with an American student, visiting their family in Chicago, and all of a sudden, I'm hearing a lesson about Great Uncle Fred, you know, and, and, and kind of where the family land is, and so forth. But it was that real sense of belonging to family, to this extended family. In Japan, it was this real sense of belonging to a company for whom you might work your whole life. And in the United States, it was all about, here's the career I'm building. Here's who I am. Here's what I'm accomplishing, along with maybe my immediate family. So when you think about this in a workplace environment, and you know, you've, you've undoubtedly looked at some of the bullet points up there, but you know, what, what, what do you run into in that situation? I remember very well being in Hawaii and working with this Tongu construction guy. And in the islands, here's how we work. We work for a few days, and we disappear for a few days, right? Because, you know, my child's first birthday's coming up, and that's a you know, three-day event, and so I, you know, I take off. <laughs> you know, huh? <laughs> so, so, I mean, I, we were experiencing this, and we're trying to get this job done. He's building this lovely rock wall for us, and it was really cool and all that, but it was just taken forever. And my wife one day turned to me, in kind of a smart alecky kind of way, which is what I love about her some days, and said, Norm, you're the cross-cultural teacher. Why don't you fix this situation? Or are you all theory? <laughs> all right, so I'll take that challenge. So the next, so I, so I thought about that for a while. I thought, hmm, all right, yeah, I'm supposed to know what to do here, right? So the next time he came by, I said Talfa, that was his name. And Talfa was this huge guy, like six foot four. I'd shake his hand and my whole hand would just disappear. You know, he was, he was a great guy. Um, I said, Talfa, you know, we've got family coming in two weeks. And I really wanted to be able to show him this wall because I really like how it's going. Boom. He stayed there. The next few days, the job was done. We had no more problem, right? And we really did have family coming. It wasn't a lie. It wasn't pure manipulation. But he could relate to that. Right? Oh, you've got family. Oh, family is so important. Oh, yeah, of course, I'll put forth my best effort. I'll work really hard. I'll get this done. And he did. And I got to tell my wife, eh, eh, see you. <laughs> you know what I'm doing. <laughs> All right. So if you think about the countries that are individualistic versus collectivistic, who's number one? Yes. Good old USA. There we are. And again, neither good nor bad, simply cultural traits. And you have to, as a leader, find <coughs> ways to eat your followers to work together who are coming from different mixes, or if you're leading in a team with some of your culture to be able to handle it. 
So you look up there and you see what? You see the Anglo countries up there, right? Quite high. And then as you come down this side, you'll kind of see a mix. You'll see quite a few Asian countries in here. Um, Arab countries would belong somewhere towards this end as well. Uh, there is some kind of a correlation. I've taken it out of here on income. The wealthier you get, the more individualistic you start to become. And why is that? Okay, you take pride in things that you own. Creates more, creates more opportunity for you as an individual. You tend not to need safety nets as much either, right? One of the things I was really impressed with when I was living in um, Philadelphia, and Jeremy's parents were actually a very big part of this, was we had a ward that had some Hispanic membership and, a, and then a lot of kind of European ancestry folks. And for those of you who know the LDS church system, which is probably many of you in here, um, there's kind of a significant welfare program where when somebody starts to struggle, loses a job or whatever, uh, you know, this program kicks in and there's this institutionalized response where some food is provided and potentially some money and some job assistance and so forth, right? And, and there's a reporting structure to, to get that happening, to make it happen. I was always impressed because when I went to the Hispanic community, that safety net was very well was still alive. And so when somebody got into trouble, what happened? You know, you'd send the leader of the congregation of the ward over there, and by then they'd already had visits from five other Hispanic families, there had been food brought in, people were trying to help them find a job and all that kind of thing. And so it comes back to this notion of a safety net and a collectivistic culture. All right. So when we look at individualism and collectivism, you know, I kind of gave you one example of where I was able to demonstrate a little bit of leadership because I understood kind of how these differences work. All right, if we look at where Mexico falls, Mexico falls kind of at the other end of the scale. So as you're providing leadership potentially in Utah Valley, an area that's increasing in, in kind of Latino membership, um, you know, this may come into play. I remember very well Poor Jeremy, he's going to get picked on. He's going to wish he never came today. But I remember very well his parents asking me a question. His father asking me a question. Sorry, Jeremy. But his father came to me one day. We had a lawyer, a member of the ward, who was moving out. They were moving to Chicago, I think it was. And his dad came to me with a very sincere, honest, and confused question. He's like, Norm, why are they moving out of the ward? Why are they moving to Chicago from Philadelphia? And I said, well, you know, he got a, he got a new job, and it's an increase in pay, and some new opportunities, and all that. And, and these were fairly wealthy people. They were living in a nice house. They had it made, no problems. And poor Jeremy's dad, collectivist at heart, well, yeah, but why would they leave their family and all their friends and people who love them just to go earn more money? And I thought, what a revealing response of the difference between individualistic culture and collectivistic culture. What's more important, my accomplishment, my progression in my career, or belonging to this, to this group? So interesting. Okay, Jeremy, I won't, I won't say anything more about you or your family or anything today, all right? The next one that's played a huge role in my career is this idea of power distance. And it's this idea of how uneven we're willing to distribute kind of the rewards and the trappings of power. You know, how likely is it that you're going to call me sir when I enter the room? Highly unlikely, right? And I wouldn't expect you to unless you're in the ROTC, right? But this idea that it's natural to have these distinctions in power and social status and so forth. And so high power distance cultures, you get interesting things going on like um, managers make decisions autocratically and paternalistically. I'm the boss, everything comes through me, I make the final decision. I may, I may consult with you, I may not consult with you. If I'm a low power distance culture, I'm likely to engage in consultation. Yeah, I don't want to make these decisions without the input of my team and so forth. Uh, in high power distance cultures, I tell you what to do and you'll do it. Why? Because I'm the boss, right? In low power distance cultures like the United States, I tell you what to do, especially here in academia. And what do the faculty say? Why? Yeah, why? Why should we do that? Down, you know, and, and that's kind of a characteristic of a low power distance culture. Uh, and, and as you might imagine, Mexico comes pretty high on that power distance, more accepting of, of that social difference. The United States is pretty low. And I remember when I was working in Saudi Arabia, it, it was such an interesting, interesting situation. All right, sorry, this was in the UAE, in Dubai. And when I was in Dubai, we were just building a new building for the university, moving out of these rented quarters into this brand new wonderful building. And I remember going into the building, and there were a couple of hallways that came down here, 
and there was a, an atrium in the middle, and there were faculty offices on either side of both those hallways. And then there was a little area out here where there was a, 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 an elevator. And then you went around the corner over here from the elevator, and that's where the dean's office was. And I thought, huh. I was an assistant dean at the time. And the dean was over there all by himself. Big office, secretarial support, etc. And when they, when they were finishing my office, I was, just, I was completely uncomfortable with that because I knew that I should be with the faculty. I should be over here where the action was happening, right? But they had built that office over there because that's high power distance stuff. No, you're the dean. You're not in there with the faculty. Are you kidding me? Why would you be in there with the faculty, right? When I was in Saudi Arabia, they, it was a new university and they were just kind of building the business me. I got to occupy my new office for about two weeks before I left. In my new office, I think it was about, um, I think it was about 600 square feet large, right? Uh, it had a bathroom, my own private bathroom, that had a shower, all very nice marble, well done, had a couch, had a separate big table and stuff. Um, and, and it was, why? Because well, I'm the dean, right? That's what deans get, they get big offices. And I got to fly business class everywhere I went, which was really kind of nice. I missed that a bit. Um, so kind of differences in low and high power distance. Now, you know, the interesting aspect of that from a leadership perspective is how do you lead in that environment? So I had a number of Western faculty. My administrative staff tended to be Arab, Saudis or otherwise. You know, so I've got the regular Western faculty and I'm having to treat them in low power distance consultative manner. And on the same time, I've got these staff who just expect to be ordered around. Just tell me what to do. Don't ask me, just tell me, right? Now again, that's a stereotype. Some of them like the consultative style, but it was something of which I had to be aware. All right. So if you want to look at the cultures again, Philippines, Anova Marcos, 3,000 pairs of shoes or whatever she had, high power distance. And you know, there are some complaints that we get uh, about kind of the first lady having all those shoes, but on the other hand, you know, she's the president's wife. Of course she has that many pairs of shoes, right? And if you come into the Scandinavian countries over here, pretty low power distance, USA fairly low, a lot of the Anglo countries over there. Um, all right, so let's move into one last, whoops, wrong way. One last one, no, let's not even talk about this one because quite frankly it's a little wonky. Um, <laughs> I want to leave you guys a little bit of time for questions, so we'll skip over some. Th that's just kind of scratching the surface. Another one, and I'll just mention this one as the last one, is universalism and particularism. In universalistic cultures, we tend to treat everybody the same, right? In particularistic cultures, we tend to treat people differently according to their life situation. So if I'm from a universalistic culture, it's time for raises in the organization, you know, it's the annual evaluation period. I may take into consideration, well, in a universalistic culture, I just say, well, what was your job performance? You did well, okay, great, here's your raise. You get the same raise that everybody else who did well got, right? In a particularistic culture, I may take other factors into consideration, such as, oh, well, you know, she's a pretty good employee, probably doesn't deserve a huge raise, but, you know, she's the sole breadwinner for her family, and she's got four kids. You know, of course I'm gonna give her a bigger raise. So do the standards change? And in many ways, in tribal cultures like Saudi Arabia, the standards change significantly, not based on how many kids you have, but based on whether you're part of the in-group or the out-group. Are you part of this tribe or are you part of that tribe? And that's something I discovered in, in doing research. I was part of a research team, had a big government grant, and there were about half Saudis and half Westerners on the team. And all of a sudden, I noticed that the Saudis started getting much bigger paychecks than the rest of us. And they weren't doing hardly any of the work. And the work they were doing, quite frankly, was crap <laughs> and had to be fixed by me. You know, so I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I'm going to all this trouble. They'll recognize my value. I'll get this big, you know, kind of pay out of this. No. <laughs> I got smaller pay. The other guys got bigger pay. The Saudi guys got bigger pay. And it was all because I was on the outside. This also showed up in our dean's meetings where all of a sudden you'd have these pretty kind of what I consider normal, almost Western interactions. All these uh, you know, Saudi deans were Western trained as well. 
But then all of a sudden, you just kind of perceptively, you, you, just, you just notice that all of a sudden things had changed. And guys who used to be fighting against each other mm -hmm. were now on the same team. And there was something that changed in the interaction to where the Saudi guys were all one, all of a sudden. And you were like, man, I didn't even pick up on that cue. What happened? What caused that kind of tribalism, in-group, out-group feeling to kick into place? And kind of as a leader, you've got to learn how to manage that, how to recognize it. So, so anyway, that's just a very quick glance at what culture does for you as you're moving across your kind of cultural boundaries. And again, I want to bring this back to those of you who will choose to make your careers here, some of you will choose to make your careers in other places, but here you're going to run into that. And I run into it, you know, not infrequently, honestly, as I look at some of the interactions I have on a day-to-day -day basis. And you're going to be a much more effective leader if you can gain at least a little bit of cultural knowledge about the groups in your, in your area and develop that transcultural effectiveness in working together and overcoming those kinds of gaps. So anyway, question and answer. I think we've got a few minutes. Please. Do you think there's a connection between the like, power distance and then collectivist versus individualistic? They, they've broken these out as fairly separate constructs. So kind of quantitatively, they're pretty different. Well, Do I, you mean, see like, I mean like in the sense like the collectivistics are like OK with the power distance. Whereas the individualistics are like against it, like they hate the idea that something's over them. Like that's what I mean by that. Is that true? I think there's an element of that. Part of being part of a collectivistic culture is you know your spot in society, mm -hmm. right? And if you play that role well, then you're happy and everyone around you is happy. So I think that's right in terms of you know there's a natural acceptance of here's a leader. I defer to the leader because that's the leader's natural role, as compared to me saying, hey, I could be that leader someday. I've seen this in, in Pacific Island culture quite a bit, where the eldest son, that's gender-based, is kind of the leader when the father dies, right? And has kind of financial responsibility for the rest of the family and so forth. And it's not that son number two or three can overthrow him because he's more competent or gregarious or whatever. Mm -hmm. No, it's pretty sad. Okay, one here. Yeah, do you find it hard to generalize like these four cons that come up to the entire culture because it was only set for IBM employees? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. You know, are IBM managers different? Now, the, the reality is IBM managers were chosen because they bought into that IBM culture. And so at some level, it actually masked some of the cultural differences, I think, because these were all people who had been trained in the IBM way. Exactly. Having said that, that is a criticism that gets levied sometimes against Hofstede's work. And you know, criticism in terms of, yeah, it's incomplete or whatever. Um, and that's why we do use it tentatively, because I've run into Saudis who are you know, more American than I'm American. And I've run into Americans who are more you know, Mexican than, than you know, some Mexican friends I have. And so there are, you've got to use these again, tentatively, right? Uh, and adjust them for any situation. Um, I was just curious, with how much you've traveled and everything, I was wondering how many languages you've spoke or learned how to um, I do English fairly well. <laughs> uh, Portuguese was a missionary language for me. Uh, my wife is half Mexican. and. She speaks Spanish a little better than I do, but I can get around in Spanish. I can read some French. I can say 10 words in Arabic. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one of the things I find is, at least in my career, and this is probably different in different situations, but the language component is not quite as important as I thought it was when I was younger. Yeah. Um, English, for business anyway, has become the lingua franca. Now, having said that, I've got my daughter in Chinese immersion, so yeah, sucking up to my Chinese friends then. <laughs> um, so you, you were saying that there's a big difference between you know, how rich the country is in collective and individualistic, right? Generally, the people that are more, the countries that are more individualistic make more money. Now, what about um, what, there was the certainty yeah, avoidance? No, it was the last one we did. Um, power distance? Uh, yeah, power distance. Mm -hmm. Is there a big difference between the power distance and, and how much money do they make as well? That's not clear cut. That doesn't come out of the literature it's at all. Not, not as clear <coughs> and part of it is you've got some very rich countries like the United Arab Emirates, which are very strong on power distance. Um, and you've got countries like the US, which is, or, or you know, countries like Mexico, which is very strong on power distance, but not nearly as wealthy. So, yeah, yeah you, you, the only one you can really use income on is, is individualism, collectivism. Yeah. 
Probably time for a couple more questions, please. So, so you've worked in a couple different cultures, had to go into situations where I'm sure like, you had to ask very, I mean, not necessarily that you're playing a role, but you had to, there's some respect things. What would you say that you did to, like, when you go into those situations and you're not sure how people are going to respond to you? Like, how did you keep, like, that when you feel safe and that people? Uh, I'm not sure I was always successful, of course. Uh, having said that, one of the things I found to be of most use is to find a cultural guide. So someone who kind of maybe is Western educated and can relate to you in your cultural level because they've lived in the United States for a while from the U.S. But then they also understand that local culture very well. And so I can't tell you how many times, I remember specifically one time at BYU Hawaii, in their very short period of time, was going to a Tongan wedding. Okay, what's this Tongan wedding going to be like? What kind of gift should I provide? What would be appreciated? And then I've done that throughout my career too. I remember in Nigeria we had an explosion at the university, five people killed, they all have to be local employees. I was part of a leadership team that had to go to their families and sit with them. This was kind of part of that culture and grieve with them and so forth. You know, and I remember asking them, I've never done that before, how do I do that? You know, and, and you want to do, especially in that kind of situation, you want to do really well. But finding that cultural diet, I think, is, is a really good way to go. So, um, what would you suggest someone who's often afraid Ah. How would I, um, how would I adapt that culture and learn beforehand? I, you know, at some level, it's a little tough to do beforehand. What we tend to do is we tend to rely on things like these studies that I've shown you and kind of get a basic feel for it, read some literature on it. If you know somebody from Guam, talk to them about the differences. My assumption is that Guam is pretty much like uh, some other Pacific islands. So, you know, if you don't know uh, somebody from Guam, talk to somebody from Samoa and so forth to get a feel for that culture. And, uh, you know, and then just when you go there, tentative interactions, you know? Okay, I think this is how this interaction is gonna go. If it doesn't, I'm, I'm okay, I'll adjust. I'm dumb not to adjust, right? Uh, so that'd be my only guidance goal, and that's cool. Okay, one here, and then one back there. Well, the leadership traits and theories that you've come across in different cultures, is there any at all that you feel have worked in a universal sense at all? Yeah, I think so. You know, but there have been twists on how you apply them. We saw those universalistic traits. I think every leader in every culture I've been in has been able to look to the future and kind of think, what's the future bringing to this organization? It's that kind of visioning, you know, activity that we need to do. What about language people um, I think, have you guys said anything with emotional intelligence yet, Goldman's work? Um, emotional intelligence, that ability to have empathy for other folks and sensitivity to it, to other people, and to realize how your emotions are impacting them and their emotions are impacting the situation. I think that's fairly widely applicable, but it does get practiced in different ways. So here in the United States, I may be fairly em empathetic with folks, and I may do that in a very one-on-one -on -one kind of a manner. Um, in some other cultures, for example, in Saudi culture, I I'd have to be very careful about being empathetic with a female employee. You know, because that could be seen as aggressive male behavior towards a woman and, you know, chop your head off kinds of stuff, right? So you need to be a little careful with that. But I could express concern through another employee or something like that. So it was the same behavior, it was the same attitude with a slightly different behavior at that point. Now I know we got to run out of here. I think time's up, isn't it? Two more minutes. Uh, one more question there on the back row. Yeah, so thinking about this while you were citing House's global study that did uh, about kind of universal leadership traits that were identifiable across many countries. And I was thinking about how difficult that would be to identify those types of traits given that different languages will define a term so differently. Yeah. And so in regards to you in business, how do you, how do you adjust when trying to to not only apply leadership in a way that that culture identifies with, but first off, you no, know, like fundamentally understanding the terms and that they use and how how they interpret the terms that you use in business. Yeah. How do you how do you understand that? And how do you work from from the language? Yeah, that's it's a great question. And it's one that they spend a lot of time thinking about through the methodology of the report of the study. Um, probably two examples of, of kind of where I've seen that come into play. Um, one example is with a friend who was doing research in Pacific Islands and was talking about strategic planning. In this particular um, uh, Pacific Island group, and I can't remember which one it was now, I apologize, but they didn't have a future tense. 
how do you talk about strategic planning without a future tense? I have no idea. That's why I let him do the work there. You know? So I just give up. Um, in, in other situations, with this research, you do something called double back translation, right? So I have an English instrument, I translate into, I have somebody with expertise translate into Portuguese, then I have somebody different with expertise translate back into English, and then we compare the two instruments and say, where are the holes? Where is the misunderstanding taking place? And in that activity, you will come up with specific words that are giving people heartburn. And the translation, obviously, is creating problems, so then you talk about it with these translators and kind of conceptually get there. So from a very formalized standpoint, that's how you do it, to make sure you get the research right. And there is a lot of work in that area. You know, from a managerial perspective, honestly, you look for cues that say something's not quite right here. I remember as a missionary in Portugal, and this well, it's UBU, we'll be all right. <laughs> Maybe I could tell a story at BYU, but, but we were teaching this, um, oh, she was a 17, 18 year old young lady who happened to also be a model. And her father was American, her mother was Portuguese. Great situation for a 20-year-old young man to be in. But um, I remember at one point, um, we were speaking English. And she asked a question, and she said, what does your church teach about preservatives? What? My companion didn't pick up on the cue that that was a weird question. And he said, my mother uses them with all kinds of fruits. <laughs> Preservativos in Portuguese are kind of contraceptives. Right? Now we're kind of, um, yeah, sorry, yeah, no, it's a bit much, but um, yeah, my face was the same color when I was there so when I figured it out. But somehow, you know, some things just happen out of context, and you're like, wait, and you start to develop a sense that something out of context is going on, and then you just kind of take a step back and you sort through it. And we eventually were able to answer her question, which was based on kind of Catholic tradition. We'll just leave it at that. I don't think we could end anywhere on that. Either. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Great question.